Okay, so I'm going to give a different perspective from Alexandra because um, I am a biologist by um, education and training. Um, having said that, I have written a lot of data workflows for GSK projects um, over a period of um, 11 years. Um, I used to manage uh, a virtual so, uh, database for projects from five years ago. But it's only this year um, I started really, I think, appreciating um, uh, application of um, knowledge graphs um, and property graphs is what I got into this year um, and, and, and how it was relevant for a problem um, I was trying to solve. Um, so we're quite focused. Um, there are other people at GSK looking at other applications of knowledge graphs in, um, in different areas. I'm not going to go into, into that, uh, but I'll just say that um, I guess the tooling that I've used for, for the stuff I'm, I'll show um, is all fair compliant. So, um, so it's a new one from Alexander's book. Okay, so <clears throat> Alexander already introduced, I guess, the uh, length of time and the costs associated here. Um, so, but just to re-emphasize again um, you know, how, how long it takes. Um, just last month, somebody told me um, this peptide prediction I've done nine years ago. So this is uh, predicting a protein that would hit um, a virus and might have therapeutic benefit in man. Uh, it only went into man the first time uh, last month. So, <laughs> uh, so there's a huge ripple effect. And I think you know the analysis that we do, um, even though it seems small at the time, um, it, 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 it does have a big impact um, on ultimate uh, decisions. Um, so that's about the length of time. We also talked about the expense. Um, and I guess, yeah, just, to, just if you look through here, um, uh, and if your projects uh, went to fail somewhere around here, um, you would already spent up a lot of uh, the budget you had uh, for your projects. So, so there's a big incentive, I guess, in the pharma industry in general that you know, if, you want, if you do want to fail, uh, fail as early um, as, as possible. Okay, so the other thing I want to keep, want to keep in mind, uh, keep this picture in your mind, I guess just, um, Think of yourself um, as a scientist who's trying to get your you know, drug discovery project through all the way here to, to registration. What you're going to face, I guess, is a scientific research council um, over here. So you have to present your scientific evidence and show that you, know, you are working on the right target, that from all the experiment and research evidence that you have gathered, that it's going to work um, in, in man, etc. You've got to show that you've, you've generated a compound that's going to have you know, quite good specificity against that intended target and the disease. And finally, yeah, that's, that's when you really know that it, it might work once it's actually gone in human, a diseased human population and shown some, some activity. So it's an extremely long uh, process, but just, uh, I guess, keep your project management hats on and think that uh, you know, you're, every time what you're doing is you're generating a body of evidence, you're going, going in front of a scientific council and, and, and presenting the case. Um, so for me personally, I guess, how did I, you know, start becoming a fan of ontologies, um, etc. So, so for me, it really, it was this discussion with um, Andrew Ritty, our CEO, um, some five or six years ago. Um, and I remember it particularly well because it was a very um, difficult meeting. The topic was uh, big data, genomics, the promise of uh, new targets. Um, and being a CEO, of course, he was um, extremely um, skeptical. Um, he's seen it all before, uh, what's, what's new, um, etc. Um, and I'll, but I think the key thing, one of the key messages from, from, from that discussion was he said, um, you know, do, we, do scientists really need uh, a lot more hypothesis uh, predicted? Or is it that you know, they need to become more or less confident in these projects that they're doing so that you know, while they're executing uh, their, their experimental uh, validation, um, you know, you can provide them new evidence to say, oh yeah, this isn't going to work in human, or this is going to work, uh, or this is going to work. Right? So either strengthening or weakening their, their confidence that, that that's actually going to work. Um, so, so these aren't things I thought of while I was in that meeting, but I think I thought I thought about that conversation a bit more afterwards. But I think two of the key aspects in that message. Um, the first one here is um, persistence. So I guess in order for an organization to become efficient. Um, yeah, there's many scientists trying to validate or invalidate hypotheses. Many different departments probably looking at the same kind of biology mechanism, but maybe for a different therapeutic in indication or for a different uh, patient population. Uh, but each one of these are generating um, evidence, and I guess we're still capturing them using um, traditional you know, Microsoft Word type forms, etc., uh, which means that you can't really reuse that knowledge to you know, support um, other cases. So. So I think that knowledge persistence uh, is, is really important and, and drives efficiency. Um, the other thing here is um, vigilance. So, so I guess this is important for your organization to be um, effective. 
Um, and, uh, and once again here, um, uh, you, know, you might be receiving a really critical piece of evidence just a little bit too late after all decisions and money have been put into place, etc. Uh, so there's a big um, monetary loss uh, if, if you miss out on, uh, on a key piece of information. So, so I think the ability to search through uh, historical work that's been done or also what's going on in the outside, um, yeah, the, the timeliness, uh, freshness was the word that David used in the morning. Um, yeah, abs absolutely important. So I did say it was aspiration of scientific knowledge management for so I guess why why is this difficult? Um, so, so I guess uh, you all know this anyway, but um, human beings use acronyms and other terms to mean different things in different contexts. So I guess just an example here, um, SDS could mean an enzyme, it could mean a substance used in cleaning products, a rare disease, or a type of um, document. How, how will the computer know uh, which one it is um, in, a, in a given context? Same with GSK, it's actually not just the name of an acronym used for the company, but it's also an um, enzyme, glycogen synthase kinase. I guess on top of this, um, if you think about how complex and uh, rooted uh, biology is, um, it's, it's not as simple, I guess, as the um, you know, Office 365 example that we saw in the demo earlier this morning, that you just get a quick drop down of all the American countries. There's a lot of deep meaning um, in, in biology. Um, interpretation is dependent on, on context, and so, um, so I think that providence piece is, uh, is, is, uh, is really important here. So, I, so I guess some of these problems for me became I guess, something I wanted to solve um, over time as well. I started thinking about you know how can we become more intelligent at uh, capturing and uh, capturing things at source and becoming metadata uh, fair, compliant, um, etc. So, so what I was thinking was uh, you know, in this process, yes, you know, we are a very regulated field, and there's a big stick for people to um, you know, have things in a specific format. Yet the attitude, um, I think something I heard even one year ago was uh, standards, water standards, isn't something you have to do just before you submit your drug proposal to the FDA. So, um, <laughs> so, so and, and that's basically you know, the attitude towards fair data in pharma, that uh, it's, it's only because you need to get it published somewhere that you, it's the last bit uh, that, that you do. So, so that's why there's, it's an effect of, the, of there being a big stick that you know, people, people respond that way. But what I was also thinking was, uh, yes, can't we take a little bit advantage of that? I mean, yes, people do have to do that, but can't we make these questionnaire systems a little bit more intelligent so that um, you know that right evidence is brought to the right person um, at the right time? So, um, so bringing, I guess, a sense of reward into that whole process um, as well. And, and I think this is just generally true of anything. You know, if you want your kids to do something, uh, it's either you're going to punish them or you're going to give them a reward. That's the only way you're going to direct them towards something. And, and that big something in pharma really is you know, guiding people towards um, what's actually going to work in human and really acting on what's going to work or and what's not going to work and, and, and making that part of the, a part of the uh, process. So for me, one thing that really captures, I guess, what we're trying to do in pharma is this um, paper from um, AstraZeneca, which is called the 5R framework. Um, so it's a really neat um, breakdown that shows um, the different motivations, the different area, core areas of questions that people need to get right in order to um, progress their projects. So some of these are the right target. So um, this is, you know, um, uh, if you're going to modulate this particular drug target, is it going to have an effect on the disease? Uh, is it, uh, if you're going to just develop a drug molecule, can you reach uh, the right target and the right tissue? Does it, have, does it pose any risks um, to, uh, to, to the patient? And also the right patient population. There's, uh, there's of course, yeah, it, it, different um, genetics that influences whether a drug's going to work or not in person. How can you identify all that? So, so once again, now I asked you to remember that um, big chevron diagram I showed at the beginning as well. Um, the key thing here is evidence for any of these blocks, any of the questions in these blocks can come at any time of the drug discovery cycle. Um, and it can come from many different types of experiments. It could be a human experiment, uh, an animal experiment, um, it could be a cell extracted from, uh, from a living organism. Um, so, uh, so it's a lot of studies, uh, evidence, uh, ways of trying to find you know, what, what, the truth, uh, what the truth is. So, so this was, I guess, one of the things that, that I followed on and became more interested in um, after that uh, talk with Andrew Whitty. 
Um, so what was happening in DSK a few years ago was um, yeah, they started forming this um, attrition reduction council. So the attrition reduction council, basically what they're trying to do is make sure that all these questions um, are always in the minds of the scientists who are trying to progress these projects and what they're responsible for doing in, 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 on top of that. Um, is, I guess, ensuring that at each of those milestones, those points between that chevron diagram, uh, that people document those findings and, um, and, are, and try to be consistent about it. Once again, they started using Microsoft Word forms, and <laughs> uh, so, so now that I've started, um, I guess, appreciating what ontologies were and the use of it, so I started talking to them about it and the fact that, uh, you know, you could start, uh, if, you, if, you, if you had some clear metadata standards or requirements, you could start actually using some of this um, Source. So, so that's good. So, so I think just to summarize, I guess, the idea that I put forward at that time was that you could um, auto suggest uh, to people um, which entities uh, it is that they're tagging. So, this could be, you know, after they filled in a section of a questionnaire. The nice, nice thing with questionnaires is it's quite, uh, quite specific, like, you know, what's the strength of rationale of pursuing this target for, for, for this disease? So while people are typing, or, or even after they're typing, we, we could just do a quick immediate semantic scan of that text box, and if the computer isn't sure whether the person was talking about asthma, the indication, or asthma as a side effect of a drug, um, it can just continuously um, tell the computer what, what the correct thing is. And the goal there is, over time, you would get more um, or label data uh, that you can use for doing you know, more, uh, more accurate um, scientific uh, searches. So I think one of the things I've learned as well is, um, yeah, yeah, of course, we've talked about AI, ML, um, etc., and, and there's a big rush, of course, at the moment to try and digitize and try and get these types of analysis um, frameworks now. Uh, but but I really think yeah, we are actually missing that um, uh, uh, a good enough um, amount of uh, expert label, label data to, to be doing the type of machine learning to support these um, decision points. So, so I think one thing I'm, I'd really like to think about is, uh, you know, where, when we set expectation with end users, people who are really um, doing these uh, the, these experiments, are, are we really doing it uh, justice by saying that your know, AI ML will, will just uh, start start helping you right now, or is it a little bit more like email spam classification, where at the beginning, when I guess in the late '90s, a lot of us were using it, you want that young here. Um, yeah, there was a lot of noise, but it's only because people started getting annoyed with that noise, they started telling it uh, you know, which one is uh, rubbish, and so the, so the computer um, started improving its accuracy. So I think it's, it's really the same thing here. Um, I don't think it's about recommending new hypothesis to people. It's really about um, the correctness of relationships that, uh, that, that really matters here, and that we need to use knowledge graphs. Um, but I think you know, that there is a place for all these types of algorithms that we're using in the machine learning space from uh, space right now. Um, so just a few examples which, have, uh, which, which I've been thinking about. So um, entity rec recognition is one of them. So I guess depending on the context of the sentence, figuring out which exactly is the URI or the entity that someone was talking about. Um, second one, document classification. Um, if somebody's really talking about something, is there something really similar that uh, they ought to know about? So if you could use that as, as part of a recommender. Um, the third one, I think, is um, reinforcement learning as well. So I guess even in um, a company like GSK, you have many different skill sets. So somebody's speciality is genetics, somebody is um, a PKPD specialist, and they use different synonyms to actually mean the same thing. So could you actually train a system to figure out you know, which is the predominant synonym for which target audience? And thereby, like, if you, if you try to improve that entity recognition and tagging at source, you could, you could figure that out um, over time. And the fourth one, I think, yeah, again, uh, long term, um, and this is where knowledge graphs will be really useful as well. So when we describe things that happen in, I guess, the animal experiment phase, we use certain terms. So for example, glucose, abnormal glucose metabolism in mouse uh, but is that really the same thing as diabetes um, in man? Right? So, so this is a typical knowledge graph problem that you know, if, you, if you have an experimental evidence, it's described in different ways, but it's actually pointing towards the same kind of you know, biology, biology uh, process. So, so there's a place for all of these, but I think um, it's really that correctness um, of the data that, that we're missing, and I think 
uh, there are clever ways that we can get better at, um, at, at trying to do that at source. Um, so I think I mentioned these points um, already, but, uh, but again, I mean, from, from what I've seen um, from, from various bioinformatics papers is, yeah, there is a big tendency to just go for unsupervised methods because of the lack of um, supervised data. But for me, the problem really is trying to find uh, the correct data so that, you know, people, and the context of the, uh, of the relationship as well, so people can figure out whether it's uh, reliable, robust, uh, repeatable, um, etc. That's, that's the key message I got from Andrew and that translated here. <coughs> okay, so with that, I guess I'll try and explain a little bit of the pilot work that I've done um, this year. So it's, it was a text uh, text analytics project. So um, so been using the um, Cybyte text processing engine. So the Cybyte um, colleagues are here today. Um, but, but really, what they're providing here, I guess, are a list of you know highly refined ontologies, vocabularies, and a means to uh, to tag documents uh, with those, as well as relationships within those entities and those um, documents. So what I've done here, um, I guess uh, I've passed here both internal documents, uh, documents that were purchased, um, external findings, passed that to that recognition engine, um, and I guess subsequently is when I did the graph parsing, so send the relationships to GraphDB, um, to, it is Neo4j, you'll see some code later as well, uh, but added the text content actually to a solar index, and uh, yeah, it's, a, it's the same data, so one reference is the other. Um, and, and a lot of the work that I did was actually, you know, see if this evidence that I'm bringing back uh, this way um, and how, how we're presenting it, does it resonate with, uh, with the people who, are, who need to consume this output? So the graph schema at the back end um, looks like this. So um, this is actually inspired by some of the work I did with um, yeah, James Malone a, a, few, a few years ago. So this, I guess, is an evidence model where what you're really modeling is yeah, there's, a, there's a piece of evidence that connects um, a triple, in some cases it's a double, it could be a protein interacting with a protein, um, a, a drug interacting with a protein. Uh, so, so modeling both triples as well as those double relationships, but it has an evidence. Behind the evidence, um, there's a document, the document has supporting text, um, yeah, it's got other um, attributes. And I think this is quite important as well, you know, capturing um, the trend in the uh, trend in the evidence is evidence as well. Like, is it something new? Is it something that people are talking about over the last couple of years? Is it something that's really well known? Um, and in case of new knowledge discovery, it's something that you want to mask out when you're presenting uh, results to, to end users. Um, so, so this is how I went about, uh, I guess, doing the knowledge modeling at the back end. So the next step was to um, I guess end, uh, get end users to try using this. So I'm going to um, just um, start pressing spacebar here, but I'll explain at the end um, what, what the query is that people are putting here. So, so again, what I've done here is I've filtered out stuff that's already established because we want to hide the stuff that people kind of already know. So in this case, they're typing in the name of a gene, so that's the Bromo Domain uh, 3 gene. Um, yeah, it is quite uh, using um, um, autocomplete text to, to make sure that you know, the entities, etc. are resolved. There's other gene members here. Then I've targeted in cardiac troponin and heart. Okay, so now, now that you've seen the entities here, I'll describe uh, the actual scientific problem that, uh, that, we're, that we were trying to solve. So basically, one of the compounds that uh, we were experimenting with, uh, we know that it hits, um, it hits all these bromodomain genes. But what they observed in the lab was that, uh, uh, that they were getting increased levels of uh, cardiac troponin. So this is a protein that's expressed in the heart. Um, so the question was, you know, um, which of these um, uh, bromodomain genes um, resulted in that, in that observation? So it's a, I guess, a classic uh, use for knowledge graphs where you're, you're, you're traversing against um, yeah, potential outcomes. So that's all they need to put in here. And as soon as you've done that, what it does is, based on the entities that you've typed in, um, it generates a list of, yeah, uh, from that set of core questions that, that I showed before, um, some of the yeah, most likely questions that, that you'd like to ask about the connection between the things that you've just um, typed in. Um, so, so many of these, I guess, are core to, to all pharma. Um, some of the things where, at some, where I had to, I guess, uh, create an additional ontology or augment existing ontologies, was we're very interested in, I guess, uh, the connection between human genetics and immune mechanisms right now. 
So, uh, so that was almost an entire like workshopy thing with end users to try and get the search terms and and, and get them added to the uh, knowledge graph. Um, so I think that was a learning as well. Yeah, there are core questions, but then there's certain things that are that are topical that um, that, that we need to add as well. I think that's just the nature of science. Um, um, but I think yeah, it's, it's important to, to keep current and, and make sure the kind of things that people are likely to scan literature back for um, are represented in the authorities we use. So now, what happens when you actually click that is um, it's going to run um, a predefined cipher query based on um, the entities that it's uh, recognized there. And the output looks as simple as this. So um, you've got the question there. So in this case, the question is, how are cardiac troponin and uh, these bromodomain genes related and, and, and heart, right? So, um, so the script behind this is actually really is simple. So there's just a list of questions. And based on the question that you're asking, certain type of entities go on this axis, certain entity types go on, on that axis. And what you're showing there um, are just a uh, you know, um, number of papers that, that connect those two things. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, it's not as complex as some of the visualizations that we saw this, uh, this morning, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's literally just a pivot table from Excel, isn't it? Just <laughs> looking at it a different way. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, uh, when I started showing this to people, um, they, they just got it. The, um, the, there's absolutely nothing confusing about what they're, they're looking at. So uh, sometimes the simplest things or whatever's worked before works. So back to that question again. Um, so which of these bromo domain genes uh, are likely to result in cardiac troponin increase? So what it's done, of course, is it's clustered the table so that the ones with the most evidence go over there. Um, so what you can see is uh, we are in T3 and 4. There's no previous papers connecting that to heart or to cardiac troponin. There's, of course, many papers connecting heart with cardiac troponin because it's a biomarker that's expressed in the heart. But there's only seven papers connecting bromo domain 4 um, to that one. So what you then do is basically just hover your mouse um, over that, and you can actually read the sentences of the entities that were identified by the algorithm. So here it says, you know, we found endogenous BRD protein for expressions induced in the heart during um, cardiac hypertrophy. So I said before, context is absolutely important in, in trusting these things. So, so the, all these things, these weren't in the initial search, but they were just context around the, extracted from, from those specific uh, publications. So it gives a uh, give the user a feel for what type of experimental work went into the back. You know, was it mouse, human? Uh, what, what, what else went into in, into building this and this connection? So um, that was just one example. Um, I guess I've been doing bits and pieces of this um, over the last couple of years. Other notable examples. Um, so the first one there, um, there's actually a key piece of evidence that um, preclinical team has missed, uh, but, but it was there from a clinical trial. Um, so using these automatic, uh, I guess, uh, relationship extraction approaches, uh, found uh, found an observation in a cl clinical trial which was highly relevant for the project that they were working on, uh, and then they went back and uh, updated their confidence. It was actually a positive example because. Um, uh, so, so, so rare diseases are basically, um, yeah, yeah, there's like thousands of them a year. It's, uh, it's like just on one patient where you're fairly, very, fairly sure which gene is causing the disease. Um, and, and, and it was just a paper that was published in a Saudi Arabia um, hospital. Um, uh, but, yeah, but it was actually talking about the mechanism and the type of drug that this project, that this project team was working on uh, as well. Um, secondly, there was... Uh, also, you know, the finding of mechanistic hypothesis that the program team hadn't actually considered, uh, which, uh, and of course, like searches are, are experiments, right? So um, they decided to look at the data and in a slightly different kind of way and, um, and found alternative hypotheses. Uh, and the third one, uh, similar to the example that I just shown now, um, yeah, it's possible to identify a plausible mechanism for something that you've observed so that you can go and try and design an experiment and validate that. So, I think just in summary, the most important thing is that it's um, really all about the questions. Um, I didn't get into this space um, uh, because knowledge graphs is just a cool thing to do. It's uh, I was trying to get solve very specific problems, um, so that's why I started. Uh, but I think um, uh, you know that's probably where I see see a big gap because there's there's something this cultural gap between the you know, IT organizations and R and D and 
and this group not spending enough time to explain the, con uh, the context of the connection that they're yeah. I think it's it's much, when you actually start talking to people, it's much deeper than just oh, this drug and, 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 and this gene, that there's very, very specific relationships that they're looking for. And uh, I think knowledge graphs, or even adding specific relationships to that graph uh, in a contextual way, um, yes, is to, uh, the right way to try and get more, get, get more correct evidence to, to help push those projects forward. Um, and yeah, I think definitely this is an area where the technology itself can help um, overcome some of these um, cultural challenges. Um, it does um, uh, take a long uh, take a long time, um, but yeah, I think it's it's absolutely important. And the knowledge graphs itself, I mean, it's something um, I picked up just because it was feeling like the right solution. But um, yeah, I think it's there to grow. Thanks. So we have time for some questions. Any questions? Um, I've got a question. So it, it, it was great talking before your um, presentation, Samuel, about um, how you were kind of new to this space. And, you know, you'd started kind of designing ontologies, I think, relatively recently. Um, I guess. What would be your single piece of advice for someone that's new to the space, get, getting into it? Um, what, where should they start? Is it with you know, picking apart existing ontologies, designing their own ontology from scratch? Um, what, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think, first of all, you have to have a problem that you're trying to solve. And, and, and I guess often it's trying to decide, like, even if it's disease, right? Um, um, in some cases, people will need to classify disease in a different kind of way for, for genuine um, reasons. Um, so I guess just to firstly check the publicly available ontologies. I think yeah, there are databases of public bioontologies that have, you know, there's more than 500 <laughs> plus. So you have to do some analysis to see what the coverage is like. Um, if one exists, then um, I guess try and see if you need to augment specific parts of it, or if there's some that you can reuse um, um, into an application ontology uh, that's, uh, that's more appropriate for your problem. Yeah, but I think there's bits and pieces that's already there, but it's just depending on what you need to solve. Cool. So, it's all about the question, I totally agree, yeah. and I was just tweeting, I think knowledge graphs are a means to an end, it should be about the user, in our case the science, the questions you want to ask, not about the graph really. The questions you're talking about, how did you get those questions, where did they come from ultimately? Yeah, so uh, the AstraZeneca figure that I showed, the 5R framework, Yeah. so most of those questions um, are um, I think, I think two of those boxes, I think the right target and the right safety, uh, I think they come from, from those areas. Um, and I guess, I mean, if you, if you wanted to convert the, the questions from that box in, into questions, yeah, it's pretty much the same as, as the ones that I've been working on. A can set the lessons which you're building out with your human system. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, I think if you wanted to expand this a little bit further um, as well, um, yeah, the core questions are there. People absolutely have to try and uh, answer answer those relationship questions. Uh, but I guess over time, there'll be other questions that we can continue to add on. And maybe you don't want to add them to the same graph. Maybe you just want to create, create a copy of this uh, that then you can analyze separately for specific problems. Um, I guess well, one thing is that I've only shown um, text mining results there. But the big value is when you start integrating that with structured data tables that you really believe have gone through some level creation. I think one interesting thing there was I asked somebody, you know. Um, yeah, like like in a big company like GSK, like when there's an important paper that comes up in, in Nature, then a certain hypothesis, uh, you know, a lot of people rush to try and, and validate that, uh, especially if it's from a notable author, uh, you know, etc. But most of the time, I think people do challenge some of the data analysis that was done. Not to make me say that you know, it's rubbish. It didn't, it didn't. So they're really trying to find out um, how, how many examples are there of positive ones that people actually believe that they'd like to persist and. I think the number of that's actually quite small. The top of the head, they could just remember one or two specific data sets. So, so really, that um, I think in David's presentation, we had um, yeah, completeness, which I don't think is as important here. You don't need all the data in the world. You just need the right ones to answer the question. Um, uh, he had from freshness. Um, yeah, I guess if it, if it is important to react to what happened yesterday. Um, another one was um, uh, co uh, correctness. Right? That, and that's absolutely where the big problem is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyone? No? Okay, well, um, big round of applause for Samuel. Thanks. For <laughs>